want to welcome everyone to this Soul Repair webinar, Moral Injury Experienced by Incarcerated Veterans and Active Duty Service Persons. I am Nancy Ramsey, Director of the Soul Repair Center at Bright Divinity School on the campus of TCU in Fort Worth, Texas. The center provides resources for religious leaders and professional caregivers who support veterans and their families affected by moral injury. Our mission includes offering free monthly webinars that further that mission with a focus on topics that have been inadequately covered or not yet addressed. We are grateful for the support of the Shea Center on Moral Injury at Volunteers of America, which co-sponsors these webinars. This webinar will offer resources for effective responses to incarcerated veterans and active duty personnel who experience military moral injury. Effective chaplaincy and strategies for care with this population are not widely understood. Our presenters bring valuable experience with incarcerated active duty service persons and those incarcerated as veterans outside military contexts. They'll help us understand how moral injury is insinuated in the lives of such service persons and strategies that they have found effective. Remember that moral injury takes at least two forms. It may be experienced as agential, something we do or fail to prevent, it may be experienced as receptive, something others do to us or fail to do, that is expected an expected aspect of our relationship. We'll learn how these forms of moral injury arise and inform the experience of incarcerated active duty service persons and veterans. The leadership for this panel includes the Reverend Kyle Fauntleroy, currently Director of Development at Bright Divinity School and a retired Navy chaplain who serve sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and their families around the world. During his career, his service included serving as brig chaplain in Yokosuka, Japan, and attending to incarcerated service persons in the Japanese Federal Penitentiary. He also served as brig chaplain at the Marine Corps base in Pendleton, California. Captain Fauntleroy served in multiple locations, including commanding officer at the Naval Chaplaincy School, and at retirement was the Force Chaplain Naval Service Force Pacific. He retired in 2017. Dr. Ron Self is a highly decorated veteran who worked in special operations in the United States Marine Corps for 10 years. Later, he earned a PhD in behavioral studies at Quantico. After his military service, Dr. Self was himself incarcerated in San Quentin for 23 years. In 2012, while in San Quentin, he founded Veterans Healing Veterans from the Inside Out. This program is proving quite successful and has received funding for three consecutive years from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. It is being replicated in multiple prisons in California. Ron also created a Veterans Yard model at Correctional Training Facility Soledad. He is the founding executive director of the First Hub, which will house some 1,200 incarcerated veterans, and two other hubs in Northern and Southern California will follow. In these hubs, veterans also receive programs and services that coordinate delivery of VA benefits for eligible vets and provide targeted rehabilitative programs. At our website, you may find the link to Ron's November 2016 TEDx talk, How to End Veteran Suicide. Our program will also include presentations, um, Captain Fauntleroy and Dr. Self, and, and then I will invite conversation between them. At the top of the hour, we'll share questions you submit through chat for their responses. I want to express thanks to Dr. Kristen Leslie, Professor of Pastoral Theology and Care, and co-director of the Eden Gleaning and Garden Project at Eden Theological Seminary. She is also a subject matter expert for several branches of the United States military on, mil on military sexual trauma and a member of the center's board. She'll serve as our chat monitor during this webinar. We deeply appreciate the production expertise of Sam McAllister at Volunteers of America. The link to this webinar will be available 10 days to two weeks from now. It will, you will find it on this center's website and at Volunteers of America. Now let's begin our webinar, and we'll start by hearing from uh, Kyle Fauntleroy. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Uh, 
Dr. Self, it's good to meet you. And I uh, look forward to more conversation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Um, Dr. Ramsey, you're not alone in recognizing the conditions returning warriors face among us. Um, I've just become aware of the uh, Veterans Justice Commission, which is a multi-year research and policy development and communications project that will document and raise awareness of the unique challenges facing veterans in the civilian justice system and build consensus for evidence-based reforms that enhance safety, health, and justice. The project spans the full scope of the justice system from arrest and diversion through prosecution, incarceration, release, and community supervision with a particular focus on veterans transition from active service to civilian life. Chaired by former Defense Secretary and U.S. Senator Chuck Hagel, the nonpartisan Veterans Justice Commission also includes former Defense Secretary and White House Chief of Staff Leon Panetta, a former Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, the Chief Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court, two formerly incarcerated veterans, and other top mil military veterans and criminal justice leaders. Over the next two years, the 15-member commission will conduct research and gather testimony to as assess the extent, of, extent and nature of veterans' involvement in the cr criminal justice system and the risk factors that drive it, the adequacy of transitional assistance for veterans as they re-enter civilian life and what strategies could better prevent justice system involvement and the nature and effectiveness of the justice system response when veterans break the law and what other interventions could or should be included. The beginning of the commission's initial assessment defines the problem as this. Military life is highly structured. Service members are told what to do and when to do it. They are routinely thrust into stressful and often violent situations, I would add lethal, circumstances that are hard for most civilians to under, understand or imagine, yet they are supported and surrounded by the training and resources of the U.S. Department of Defense. The world following military service is quite different. Veterans must fend largely for themselves in the civilian economy and society. Roughly 200,000 active duty service members leave the armed forces each year and most transition successfully, demonstrating um, often extraordinary resilience in the face of a wide array of risk factors and obstacles. Others struggle with mental health and substance abuse disorders, the after effects of traumatic brain injury, homelessness, and criminality. Approximately one third of veterans self-report having been arrested and booked into jail at least once in their lives compared to fewer than one fifth of the civilian population. According to the last comprehensive count, there were 181,500 veterans in American prisons and jails. A separate survey showed that nearly 8% of those incarcerated in state prisons and more than 5% of people in federal prisons were veterans. There are more veterans imprisoned in the United States than there are total prisoners in all but 14 other countries, but their members represent a tiny fraction of the total U.S. veteran population, just 1%. In recent years, innovations such as those that Ron's spearheading veteran treatment courts, veteran-only housing units in jails and prisons have emerged, seeking to improve support for former service members through specialized approaches. The Veterans Administration, whose mission it is to provide care and support for veterans and their families has launched efforts to help justice agencies better identify veterans and to facilitate their access to appropriate programming. But many challenges and opportunities remain. Case in point, on August 25th of this year, the Seattle Times published the story of a former Army Ranger, Luke Elliott Summer, and his request to be released from the maximum security federal prison that's held him for 15 of his 44 year sentence. 
His criminal conduct was serious, violent, and persisted over the course of many years, wrote Assistant U.S. Attorney Miller. The robbery, which involved automatic weapons and hand grenades. He led a team of armed bank robbers and possessed illegal destructive devices. Then after he fled to Canada and was eventually extradited, he assaulted a co-defendant in prison. After pleading guilty to four felonies, including armed bank robbery and receiving a 24 year sentence, Summer tried to hire someone to kill a federal prosecutor that, that prosecuted his case, emphasizing that he did not want the homicide to look like an accident. His hitman turned out to be an undercover FBI agent and Summer got another 20 years tacked on to his prison sentence beginning after the first two decades of his sentence were served. As a ranger, Summer served combat deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. In Iraq, he said, his roommate was killed by a roadside bomb. In Afghanistan, he said, his platoon was dispatched to recover the remains of a Navy SEAL team and their rescuers who died in 2005 an event that was memorialized in the movie Lone Survivor. Court motions write, for months, Summer lived, ate, and trained with the SEAL team and the Night Stalker helicopter crews. The loss of his friends and acquaintances along with his adverse childhood experiences resulted in Summer developing severe post-traumatic stress, which Summer still deals with today. Summer claimed that the robbery was a political protest to draw attention to war crimes he witnessed in Iraq and Afghanistan, a claim the army later discounted. While neither the Veterans Justice Commission nor the case of former Army Ranger Summer refer to moral injury explicitly, I think we can recognize the issue of trust, shame, remorse, despair, disgust, and all the perceived betrayal of the virtues that members of the profession of arms bet their lives upon every day. Virtues that demonstrate, characteristics that demonstrate the impact of moral injury on a human being. About the time Dr. Jonathan Shea coined the term moral injury and it became a topic of serious research, I was stationed in Japan. Part of my duties in, included providing pastoral care for our base brig, where those awaiting, awaiting trial were detained, as well as the Japanese federal prison about 30 minutes away, where soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen who had committed serious offense, offenses in the Japanese civilian communities were incarcerated in accordance with the US-Japan Status of For Forces Agreement, or SOFA. As I remember, we had about 15 servicemen in the Japanese prison, a prison very different than any I had served or visited stateside. It was an old prison with no air conditioning and only kerosene space heaters set far out of reach of any cell for any kind of warmth in the winter. Our incarcerated servicemen had committed crimes anywhere from manslaughter and rape to theft. Each of our guys had their own cell clustered in one cell block and they were no more familiar with Japanese culture than their guards were familiar with American culture. A translator was available from time to time, but mostly it was the American servicemen who'd been in prison the longest who did most of the communicating with the guards. None of the guys had experienced combat. When I reported the range of years served went from two to 12 years. So the guys knew one another very well. I had one two hour block of time that was listed for the group Bible study each week. They weren't much interested in worship. I also had another two hour block of time for ind individual appointments each week. Lastly, I was on the hook to be called in at any time should an emergency happen like news of a parent or sibling dying, a fight or emotional upheaval. There was a specific routine for every day. Nothing ever changed from week to week except for Japanese holidays, which occur almost once every month. The guys didn't know me and I didn't know them. 
they didn't trust me for a long time, even though they always were glad to have someone new to visit with, even if I was an officer. My plan to earn their trust was simple. Sure up, show up every day at the scheduled time on time. The only times they weren't under direct supervision of a guard was when they were in the company of a chaplain. And I didn't want to take that opportunity away from them. Absolutely no judgmentalism. Answer their questions with the truth and don't overcommit. I had to know what I can and can't do. Perform as a chaplain, not as a postal carrier or a caterer. Work within the perimeters of SOFA, the Status of Forces Agreement, to understand where I can and cannot advocate. They had access to medical and dental at the base, but that had to be scheduled through the prison staff. More than anything, I wanted to be authentic with them and the prison staff. Focus on the person in front of me and don't get distracted with anything in the surroundings. Respect the confidentiality of every individual and the integrity of the group. About six months into my tour, one of the guys was due for his release in about a month. He was having trouble sleeping. He didn't tell me, he didn't tell me that he was having trouble sleeping. The others around him did. They outed him during our Bible study time. He didn't want to talk about it. The, one of the guys said, chaps, he's not right. He's talking in his sleep and totally not focused during the day. You want to talk about it? I asked him. No, I don't, he said. Well, would you like to go to medical? Go see one of the docs on base? No, I'll be all right. I decided to drop it for the time being. Okay, gents, let's leave it alone for now. But please take care of one another. The group moved on to baseball and I asked and then asked me if I could bring them a Stars and Stripes next week to talk about the league standings the next week. I saw this particular young man's name on my prison appointment schedule. I was glad to see it, but I had no idea what to expect. The crux of his issue lay in the intersection of his drunk driving incident that caused him to be imprisoned that led to an injury of a young passenger of the car he hit and his victimization by his uncle who would be home when he got there. A product of a, of a Southern single parent home and a strict Christian faith, he told me that his pastor to whom he had been sent to address bedwetting episodes had told him to report his uncle to the authorities to prevent other young people from being victimized. He never did, and now left another young boy wheelchair bound as a result of his drunk driving. He believed that he had abandoned the church and God, and now God had punished him. I asked, is this, is this what's keeping you up at night? He said, all I think, that's all I think about now. I said, as long as you've been here and slept soundly, why is this happening now? I guess the cl closer I get to going home, the closer I'm getting to seeing my mom and her brother. And I don't really wanna see either one of them. And I sure don't wanna go to church with them. I'm no good anymore. God's ignoring me for a reason. Our conversation went on for almost the entire two hours. We talked about a, a lot of things, including his understandings of repentance, and forgiveness. He eventually gave me permission to make a referral to medical to address his sleep disruptions and to mental health. I told him I'd be happy to meet him at the base hospital when he was there, that he wouldn't be alone with his guards if he didn't want to be. Eventually, he was released from prison and flown to Camp Pendleton in Southern California for out processing. I got to shake his hand one more time before he left Japan. Several months later, I received a Christmas card from his mom, thanking me for her son's care while he was in prison. She wrote that he had taken his psychiatrist's advice and contacted his sister, who met him at the airport and escorted him home. 
She said he'd found a job, continues to see a civilian counselor, and attends another church with his sister's family. I believe this is more than a fairy tale ending. It's about multidisciplinary care that includes medical, mental health, spiritual health, and a trusted cohort of non professional, loving, non judgmental friends with a shared experience. Veterans incarcerated in the United States are not necessarily cut off from all of their relationships and military benefits permanently. Their access to VA benefits depends on the characterization of their discharge from the service and the length of their confinement. Few incarcerated veterans receive life sentences. Most will return to us. Navigating society without the firm boundaries and structures of military and prison life is frustrating and confusing. Just as confusing as trying to navigate a crowded high-speed turnpike without any lane demarcations. A turnpike like that just isn't trustworthy. It's incumbent upon us, we who sent them to war, to become trustworthy, to be predictable, and to establish a soft landing for them by recognizing and affirming their humanity, to honor the dignity of their service and the integrity of their company, their cohort, their fellow combatants. Look for the lonely soul on the periphery of the congregation, the lost soul in the supermarket aisle, unable to choose between too many choices, the distressed soul who'd rather sleep outside than find a hotel or a motel, and gently guide them to a place where others like them gather. Know where the veteran assistance agencies in your area are and how to connect with them. The nonprofit foundations run by veterans for veterans in your area who already have a vocabulary, a vernacular, the language, who know the places they've been and more importantly, the battles they fought and know the battles that remain. Make a place in your congregation, your community, just for veterans, a place without judgment, a place with trust born of camaraderie and interdependence where veterans can help veterans. Scripture guides us to welcome everyone. For this lost child is now found. This child of mine was dead and is alive again. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, well, Kyle, uh, I thought I knew what I was going to say um, after listening to you speak that you, you said a few things that just what I thought I heard was reference to Operation Red Wing. Um, I believe that Ranger was a part of that where the SEALs were killed in, in an attempt when one of their heroes was shot down. Um, yeah, it just it. Uh, it, that just kind of hit home. I, I've actually spoken to a few of the SEALs um, that were on that operation or that were somehow involved with that operation. And I, I was recently uh, witnessed an interview with uh, PJ Shipley. He was a SEAL. Um, he's a dub group operator. Um, he knew several of those people that were on that. And so moral injury, again, I thought I knew what I was going to say. Um, and it just kind of took the wind out of me what you just shared and it, it speaks to the powerful impact that these events have on our service members um when you initially started talking about the the veteran involved or the justice involved veterans and moral injury what came to mind for me is in my experience those veterans military personnel in the prison system get a trifecta effect if you will they and they don't really know what it is initially until the term moral injury came about now when i say trifecta what i mean is often there's an early early life experience with moral injury that clearly has to come from your primary caregiver intentionally unintentionally then there's the military and that experience with the moral injury is more of 
one of an authoritative one where you're given orders um, and then you do things that are against your own moral belief system. And then in prison, it's the experience that's more punitive. Um, and for, for many, it, it's hard to climb that mountain out of that hole, so to speak. Um, we, I didn't even hear of moral injury until 2016 when I myself was in San Quentin running a group, as we were speaking about earlier, when Rita Brock came in and she introduced the term to us. And we had several people, several Vietnam veterans in that group that were really struggling heavily with their PTSD because they were told and they were diagnosed that they had PTSD. When in actuality, after exploring the moral injury, come to find out in their own minds, they determined that they had a moral injury, not a PTSD diagnosis that was given to them. And just as a result of being able to identify what they were actually feeling and how those feelings actually mirrored up with a moral injury, not a PTSD, the nightmares started to go away. In fact, they went completely away for several of them. And it was just the ability to have an understanding of what was actually going on inside them. So this term moral injury, as you mentioned, coined by Jonathan Shea in the 80s, I mean, it really is, it's, it's powerful. Um, I would characterize it as a branch on the same tree of PTSD um, with similar um, symptoms, but yet separate and distinct symptoms. A lot of the guys that I met inside, inter interestingly enough, every combat veteran I met is definitely vocalized that they definitely have PTSD and moral injury. And being able to distinguish the difference between the two was very helpful. What I also found interesting was for the guys that were non-combat veterans. Um, they too have, in fact, I believe the PTSD rate among non-combat veterans is higher than combat veterans. To me, that kind of makes sense. For a combat veteran, they know what they experience that's causing them to feel some kind of way. Uh, could be the loss of a limb, the loss of a, a friend, just the things that happen in combat, traumatic brain injury, IEDs, uh, intensive, horrific firefights. Um, now, for the non-combat veterans, I, I, I had an experience where we were deploying from the ship. Uh, we were on LPH-11. It was the Duluth, I believe. And, you know, the relationship is somewhat playful between Marines and and sailors and, and other branches. But when, when it's war, that relationship gets a little more serious. Where I'm going with this is every time we would gear up to get on the helo to leave on a mission, there would be Navy guys around that would help us load our mags, tape our grenades, check our gear for us, kind of send us on our way. And every time we came back, they were there waiting for us. I mean, like, like a mother waiting for a child to come home. And I say that in a very respectful way. Um, I came back from an operation where nobody came back but me and those sailors were there and there was one sailor in particular who was so distraught that Dave the person that he helped in my unit get his gear ready did not come back he later hung himself um, and I think that speaks to a different type of moral injury right um, it, it clearly was no one's fault he 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 felt his own sense of, I can't even articulate it, but to me, what came to mind was a moral injury when, when, I, when I heard about that. Um, and for many others, when they're told uh, an LZ is too hot to go back in and pick up troops or to help troops. I've talked to many pilots that, that just felt they inflicted their own moral injury because they they wished on hindsight that they would not have followed orders and they would have went back um, and to render assistance as best they could, especially after o Operation Red Wing when that helicopter got shot down. Um, there, there was a lot of conversations going on while that was happening uh, as a result of, of what happened there. Um, I could go on all day talking about this stuff. Like I said, I thought I knew what I was going to say. And, and your very powerful introduction uh, and what you shared, it, it just kind of brought me to a place. I guess my own, my own moral injury. For me as a combat veteran, um, I had my first moral injury as a child. Had nothing to do with the military. And frankly, that moral injury, I believe, and it was, it was I'll just share it. When I was six years old, my father kneeled down, put his hands on my shoulders, said, you were a mistake. You should have never been born. You're the reason your mother and I are getting divorced and I'm going to Vietnam. That's the last I ever saw of him. 
as a six-year-old child, I didn't know what to do with that. I just knew that my hero, I think every dad is every son's hero, was gone and I was a mistake and that's why he was gone. That created in me throughout the rest of my life in military schools and whatnot, um, I was constantly looking for an older authoritative father figure that if I worked hard enough, I could prove I wasn't a mistake um, and I would be accepted. Now in my mind, this is all going on in my mind, trying to prove that I'm not a mistake. So that was my first experience as a child. Then in the military, trying to achieve that in my mind of not being a mistake, I felt I took a lot of risks, <clears throat> unnecessary risks. I wasn't any more brave or heroic than the other men I served with. I was just driven in a way they weren't. And then I really, I really believe that many of those men aren't here now because they followed me and what I didn't know was going on with me at the time was that moral injury and it was driving me in a way and they followed me. They just thought I was this very mentally tough Marine, special operations guy, professional. When, it, when in reality, I was just as scared as anyone else. Um, I, again, just driven by something else. And then in an effort to stop somebody from being killed, I shot somebody and I went to prison 23 years for that. I was sentenced to 32 to life. Then I get to prison and you start to experience a different kind of moral injury. And there's, there's, it's, it's being worked on, it's improved greatly, but within the prison system, there's, it, it's comprised of correctional officers are largely former military people. Now, a lot of those officers, when they find out you're a veteran, they kind of cut you some slack, but you'll always get one or two that think you're a disgrace because you're in prison and you're disgracing the military. I had the unfortunate experience of encountering a Lieutenant who was a Marine and he was an officer in the Marine Corps, and he made it his mission to make sure I knew that I was, um, I should be ashamed of myself for my actions. I mean, he moved me from cell to cell every day for a month. He, he, just, he just did things that were really just out of line. Um, and I kind of felt like, you know, well, I kind of deserve it. Uh, so that, that ultimately, that and me doing my own introspection about my own moral injuries and the things that I did that I believe led to many people who were following me get killed, um, I braided a rope and hung myself. Uh, the rope broke, go figure. Um, and that's when I decided to create this program that turned out to be a very effective program for working with incarcerated veterans in the prison system, obviously. And then we met, more, we met uh, Jacques Verdun, who runs the... Um, GRIP program, Guiding Rage into Power. He brought Rita in, who introduced us to Moral Injury, and uh, yeah, the ship kind of sailed from there. We just kept exploring it more and more, uh, and here we are today, talking about it. So again, any, anything, I, I would love to, rather than me talking all day, <laughs> I would love to interact with, uh, with you a little bit more and actually have yeah, you. Yeah, right on. Um, it, just this exercise of, of um, I mean, I've been out five, five years now and, and going back and visiting and going over my, my notes and my diaries from years ago, um, which helped me re remember this guy. I don't know. It's it. Name in the in the church, we call it naming the demon. Um, we, you, you wanted to put a label on it, and it, which makes sense when we talk about non-combat moral injury and combat moral injury within, perhaps even within the same command. I mean, the guys that can name it, that can put a place in time, um, and they can put a name on it quicker than the than the non-combat guys like the the sailor who was so faithful to you guys um, and, and, and your teammate that didn't come back. Um, I'm, I'm sorry somebody didn't sidle up to him uh, on the Duluth um, and, and find him um, before he, he hung himself. Um, um, 
I, I think there's, uh, within the chain of command, there are good leaders and not so good leaders, right? And, 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 and the, sometimes we can experience betrayal. Um, I've, I've got, a, I've got a, a buddy who retired as a, as a, as a three-star, and he doesn't like the term moral injury. He said, what we do is righteous. We're all within the, with, within the rules of engagement. We're, we're all, all there, but. Marine Corps calls it internal conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. to say otherwise, it would admit that we're inflicting. Well, I was, I was introduced. At, what, what drove the term home to me was, was, visiting, was visiting with a, and this is not, has to, this doesn't have to do with the criminal justice system. This has to do with moral injury. Was with a, a, a sergeant of Marines um, in, in the first Gulf War, the 96 hour war. Um, he was a turret gunner as a Lance Corporal Corporal. Um, and he did exactly what he was supposed to do. He was manning a 50 cal and he walked it up and, and took out the threat. Um, the Marines got out, disembarked the convoy to do recon of, of the Iraqis, the dead Iraqis. And he got in this guy's wallet and found a, a photograph of the guy's family that looked exactly like his family. And, and pardon my language, but he was bullshit from then on. You know, he made the, he made the connection between him being at war and this this other young this Iraqi young man being at war, and both of them having a wife and three kids at home. That's what upended his his apple cart. Um, he didn't come to me for another another two years uh, at El Toro that you and I were talking about earlier. Right. Um, and he couldn't sleep. He was not interacting with his family in a healthy way. Um, so we had, again, because I know my limitations, I had to get medical involved to get him to treat the sleep so he could get some sleep and recharge his, his batteries. Um, but it wasn't until um, we talked about um, the world sometimes just is absolutely not right. And what ought to be, what ought to be, the way the world works is upended momentarily in, a, in one split second of time. And, and it completely disorients um, our moral compass, whatever we want to call it, our, our relationship with the universe. I, I, I don't know what to call it. I, I have my religious language that I know what to call it by, but I, I, don't, I don't presume that on anybody else. Um, and, and I personally think that society as a whole, speaking within the United States, I think we can do better. I think we, I think we can do better. I, I applaud this, this, this new thing that Secretary Hagel and, and Secretary Panetta are doing, but they're, they're talking about years. And if, and if we're losing, and if we're losing 22 vets a day to suicide, that's going to be 16,000 vets in two years. Yeah, it's, I, I hear what you're saying there. Um, I'm a commissioner on that commission, in fact, um, the one you just mentioned with oh, good. that and Hagel. Actually, I was asked to be on that commission. And uh, one of the things that's interesting, I was asked to be on the commission because they want to find results or a pathway to correct the things that veterans are experiencing. That's why I'm here. And I, I tend to agree with you. I don't think we need to spend 10 years doing a study. I think I can tell you right now what the problem is after having been doing it since 2012. And to me, it's a matter of, I think the commission came along at the right time because what yeah. we need to do is change some policies. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that it is kind of a taboo topic when we're dealing with moral injury, moral injury is the, the military sexual trauma. Um, I had a guy in the prison at San Quentin who he was a Navy guy, non-combat vet. He was raped by other Navy people while he was in the military, he was able to prove that. They gave him an honorable discharge. Then when he was out in town, he was at a bar, he got drunk, he went into the bathroom. One of the same guys that raped him on the ship came into the bathroom and tried to accost him and he took the toilet seat, that ceramic toilet seat cover off, hit him over the head with it, killed him, got sentenced to 25 to life. And he refused to talk about in court why he killed the guy 
and it had to do with shame and his own moral injury, his own sense yeah. of being betrayed, not only by the military. They offered him nothing but an honorable discharge. Okay, here, go. You're, you're yeah. done. Yeah. Um, and then when he admitted it, here's a real moral injury. When he was diagnosed with PTSD while in prison as a result of the rape, he went back to his parole hearing, which by coincidence was the same year. And he, he then was, after doing the program, he felt good enough about himself to know that this wasn't his fault. Yeah. He talked about the rape and they called him a liar. Even though he had proof of the rape from his PTSD claim and his military records, they said, you're a liar. You're just making up excuses. And they gave him a five-year denial. And that, that was four years ago. The man's still in prison. Not that what he did is justified and okay, but there is extenuating circumstances there that revolve around moral injury and military sexual assault. And it's not just, you know, it's men and women, unfortunately. A lot of people, they don't publicize those numbers as much as they should, but men experience uh, military sexual trauma as much as I think women do. Um, I think Kristen Leslie can speak more to that. Yeah. That's her, her, her forte. Yeah, she's the expert on that, right? I don't want to venture far down what I don't know the statistics of, but I, I saw a lot of that moral injury in prison related to MST. Yeah. So anyway, the commissions, yeah, we're, we're looking to address a lot of these things. I think moral injury is needs to be much more elevated um, in the discussion, and it, it needs to be, I think the conversation needs to be a bit more public and a bit more talked about. Yeah, that's why we're here, bro. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, okay, sir. <laughs> you're fine and, and i don't know my doctor to me it's a label that i acquired because of the school i went to for psychological warfare I, i'm just ron self i believe what we do is peer-to-peer -peer based um, right on it I, I has to be yeah i don't lead the groups with with anything other than i'm a marine yeah well can you say more about the inside out approach of our program yeah so veterans healing veterans from the inside out, yeah. kind of a double entendre there. Well, I mean, it, it has a twofold. I meant it to have a twofold meaning. It's healing ourselves from our own internal injuries, right? Our own moral struggles. And then from the prison system, it's from the inside of the prison system out. When I wrote the curriculum for the program, I was so enthused about making or trying to make sure other veterans didn't come to prison and didn't try to hang themselves. I created a program that I intended to be for active duty personnel and just neglected to think about the fact that I was in prison and had no way to deliver the program. Um, so the TED Talk came along. And what happened was we started getting active duty veterans or active duty military personnel and veterans in the community that were getting cleared to come into the prison weekly to go through the year long process of the group. Um, and that's really where it took hold. And they began to get healing. They began to move on with themselves, pull the anchor out of the mud, so to speak, and course yep. correct. And yep they would start going to other prisons and helping us spread the program. So now we're in Colorado, California. We have the Veterans Hub. Uh, I'm on the commission and I hope to replicate the hub system nationally with the right commission and people like Chuck Hagel and, and Panetta um, and all the other wonderful people on this commission. But th this is a piece of the puzzle that has to be talked about. Yeah. And, and, and we got, we, we've got to do it before we get out before we get out of the military, before we get out of, of a structured environment. Um, you know, some, when I got out of the Navy, I felt like a little kid, and I'd been in 30 years. I felt like a little kid sneaking out of the backyard and going someplace I wasn't supposed to go. And I mean, I, I, I was curious. I wanted to see what it was like, but I, but I left the safety of the backyard. Um, because for me, it was safety. It's not safe for everybody. Um, but um, Tell me, did you experience to any degree a loss of identity? When um, I left the military? Yeah. 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 That, that seems to be a consistent theme. I just. Yeah, I. <laughs> I mean, 30 years, I, that's a long time. I think, I think, I think, I think I've told this to Kristen and, and to Nancy both. I, what do I wear to work in the morning? You know, I, I never had to make that call ever in my life. Um, fortunately, I, I married, I married well to a, a, a bright human being 
um, who was able to coach me through a lot of this stuff. My wife happens to be a, a social worker by original profession. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't, uh, it was, it, and I, and I, yeah, it was weird. It was really weird. Um, coming yeah. back, coming back, coming back to an institution that d didn't know that endorsed me, that endorsed, endorsed my ministry in the military, but had no clue what I did for a living. Wow. Um, so when I, when I came back, I would, I mean, you're, you're entering into therapy now, Ron but <laughs> it's all good stuff. Um, I'm gonna see, I, I wanna just share a couple of questions with you all that are coming up. Thanks, thank you, Sam, for helping me chip back in. I, uh, there's a, you all are stirring up a lot of interest and um, I don't so much wanna stop, I certainly don't wanna stop the productive conversation and important conversation you're having, but I want to insert a few questions from the audience at this point in well, terms of just how they're, raising up um, some things and also questions that I had, which is how, how do you, um, how do you uh, reflect on uh, the point you just made, Kyle, about before folks leave, um, I'm sure there's a correct uh, military term for leaving, you know, finishing one's duty and um, right. exiting the military, but uh, I believe, Kyle, that you were a part of a process for that in the Navy. Mm. And, and listening, uh, thinking about your own experience with the brig um, and the penitentiary, but also what Ron has shared, are there further ideas for um, prompted for you about um, the ways that chaplains and other officers um, can be alert to um, challenges that might uh, that someone might be taking with them um, uh, from their military service. You want me to go wrong? Either sure. of you can go. For, it, uh, that's it, fine it's for two, both of you to respond. It, it's a two week. It's a two week program that that the that the Navy provides, um, and it helps you craft a resume. It 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 shows you what a suit a civilian suit looks like and how to tie a tie and blah blah blah, but. But what it what it doesn't do is, you know, they, they you practice interviewing for a job, but maybe you shouldn't interview for a job right away. Maybe you should take a a period of Sabbath in my language. You know, take a month, take two months to to find out who you are, not what you do. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I think what Nancy is talking about, when you leave the military, it's called separating. Yeah. Your separating service. I believe what you're talking about, Kyle, is the, the TAP program, Transitional Assistance Program. And yeah. what I've heard from everyone I've ever talked to, and I've set in on a few, is this death by PowerPoint. The only thing that comes out of that is a resume. Um, and, and frankly, it wasn't designed to be a resocialization program. It wasn't designed that way. Uh, my recommendation in this commission is to move forward and deconstruct the TAPS program, keep the resume portion of it, but a large emphasis needs to be put on um, re-socialization, incorporating who you are now in your life's experiences going in back into the civilian world. I mean, the reality is once you leave something like the military, no matter what branch you're in, you, you have been a part of something for 30 years, like Kyle, that's bigger than anything you will ever be a part of in your life again, more than likely for most. Um, how, do you, how do you do that, right? How do you go from being a part of something so big to when you said, how do I dress? I, I, that's, I, that really struck me. To this day, 30 years I've been out, right? And I still tuck my shirt in and iron my pants. And people are like, Ron, you're not in the Marine Corps anymore. You don't have to iron your pants. You don't have to tuck your shirt in. You, you know, you don't, have a, you don't have a liberty inspection. I'm like, how do you not tuck your pants in? How right. do you, you look like a short day dog? You're all wrinkled. And I mean, so there are things about the military that are good, right? I think oh, yeah. things that are not so great is the lack of camaraderie that you now have. You don't have that anymore. I mean, when you're in the military, you can't wait to get out. And when you're out, you wish you could go back. It's just That's this huge. That's huge. The camaraderie is the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, we could go back and forth all day on, on the TAPS program. I think um, just to 
go back to that very powerful story that you shared of your own experience, Ron. I'm wondering if, if the kind of being cut loose from a very intense, if not familial, um, experience, um, at least deeply um, interwoven obligations one to the other, and to be um, on one's own, especially if pre-military, that was not such a, um, that wasn't as powerful or useful or supported experience. Um, I would think that uh, for some folks that might predispose um, or at least make someone vulnerable to experiences with the law. Oh, you're absolutely right. When I came back, um, to be clear, after what happened with my father um, and then going to my grandparents shortly, who then enrolled me in military schools, literally from the age of six on, I was in military schools, mm -hmm. academies, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. The Marine Corps was my family. And when I came back without those people, uh, yeah, it gutted me. And then when they told me, we're processing you out, you have too many injuries, you're a step too slow, your shooting's an inch just off, you're starting to degrade. You're, you've, your body can only physically operate at the level of an Olympic athlete for so long, um, and you have to go. That, that gutted me, and I was resentful. Um, and I was also looking for a way to still be of help, to still somehow be useful which is how I got involved with, with shooting this gentleman, trying to stop him from being killed. I was trying to be helpful. How I did it was completely irrational um, and made no sense. And I deserved to go where I did. And frankly, I think at a subconscious level, I was taking myself out of society because I didn't have the courage to kill myself. Mm. And then after sitting in a four by nine cell for a decade, um, I came to the conclusion that I brought so much shame to the Marine Corps, to myself, to my teammates that died, uh, I tried to kill myself. Mm -hmm. And for many of, I, I, I keep my phone on 24 seven and I probably get three calls a month on that phone. I had a Marine call me who saw the Ted talk and he just said, he just said, I wanted to say, I'm sorry. And while I was talking to him, he shot himself. Um, and oh boy. I, a lot of the guys I talk to, a lot of what they're feeling has to do with, again, a loss of identity and what they're internalizing and what they're starting to learn about moral injury and the injury that they've caused. And when they, I know it's not intended to go this way, but sometimes when you learn about something, it can be a curse because then you realize what it is that you've done. Um, the more I've learned about moral injury, the more I see how much of that that I, I ushered on to other people in my life, unwittingly, right. of course, unwittingly. Um, but we all have our own trials and tribulations. It's just, yeah. more, again, they get that extra dose, that extra straw on the camel's back. Right. So. Kind of amplified. Um, oh yeah, that's a perfect way. word for it. Right. So, you know, Kyle, when I think about you having this assignment as a chaplain, if you could help the military now to prepare chaplains for that particular kind of assignment, knowing what you do now, what, what would you want that preparation to include uh, to help prepare a person to be effective in responding to the kinds of issues that you and Ron Self have been talking about? I've been advocating um for CPE, um, clinical pastoral education for all chaplains uh, entering the military for a long, long time. Um, there are lots of reasons that, that the government can't mandate that. But I think specifically, just as hospital chaplains require CPE, I think prison chaplains ought to require CPE because you, you've got to know someone before you can, you can guide them out of the room. You've got, you've got to know people. You've got to build relationships. That, that engender trust. And, and, um, and I tried, tried to reflect that it, in my remarks. Um, our, in the military, your lives literally depend on each other right. every day at sea, literally. Mm -hmm. um, um, and when you go into combat, you know where everybody is. 
um, you've, you've got a specific field of fire and you're responsible, you are responsible for that field of fire. And you've got to trust those on your left and your right to, to conquer their own field of fire. Um, so I, I would, what would I train chaplains? I had the chance to train tra chaplains, but I didn't have the final say. Yeah. But I, I, say I, I, I think, go ahead, Ron. It might help or might not only say help. You don't need any of my help or anything. One of the things as a combat veteran that I found, it's a very slippery slope and I'm glad that I'm not in your shoes, Kyle, or anyone else's that is in that situation. Initially, when the, the topic first came about, there were, there, was, there was some talk about embedding chaplains in frontline units that are in combat. One of the worst things that I think you could do is to get in a combat-oriented unit team leader or anyone on the team's head about a moral injury before they're going into combat. Mm -hmm. You start getting into these things, when you see a child walking towards a patrol that you right. know has a grenade, Kyle, the sniper that was killed, unfortunately, by a Marine here stateside after he survived all he did, um, he had to shoot many children that were walking towards American units with grenades and, and satchel devices. Um, it's a hard thing to talk about any frontline combat unit to talk about morality when these men have to go into combat and make morally arduous, really impossible decisions, hard right. decisions. Especially when you're looking at someone and you have a child that's that same age, just like the gentleman you were spoke you spoke about, Kyle, with the 50 cal, did his job, finds a picture, this person who wasn't his enemy, who's he's it's someone they're told is your enemy, but yeah. they'll kill you if you don't kill them. And and they have three kids and a wife, like you have three kids and a wife. It's an it, it must be incredibly hard for a frontline chaplain mm -hmm. to navigate this. Right. I, I can't even imagine. Kyle, I can't even imagine. You, you, you do it. You do it after the fact. You, you you encourage, you inspire on the front end, and you you exercise compassion and consolation on the back end. Right. Um, um, because we we go through we go through the rules of engagement, and 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 the lawyers do that thing right, um, but it doesn't make anything easier. It doesn't make any so. I I, I think I think I I'm just a big proponent, Nancy, of 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 CPE because it teaches you how to listen and how to attend to the whole person. I agree with. I do agree. I've, I've been benefited from CPE myself. It seems to me that in addition to CPE, you two are raising specific kinds of knowledges, so one can use the skills of listening and self-awareness and CPE. However, I'm, I, I guess what, what occurs to me is um, helping a chaplain who's going to enter, um, you know, particularly working either with the brig or in a penitentiary as Ron has described, um, it, it, it's also knowing something about um, what might lead a person to act in ways may be related to military moral injury or PTSD that was incurred in battle. But it's, so it's more than the listening kinds of and self-awareness skills of chaplaincy of, of CPE. It's, it's particular knowledges that you're both describing um, that would inform skillful chaplaincy in that context. At least that's what I'm hearing. Help correct what, if I've misheard. No, I, I think you're right. I think, I think one has to know both the boundaries of, of the institution and what resources are available within the given institution, whether it's a prison, what, what are the helping resources? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what are the, what's the, in, the institutional culture? And then what are the social cultures within the institution? Um, exactly. Who, who are the people around them? Um, you know, my guys in Japan um, were, no two were from the same neighborhood. They were, they were from all over the place. Um, but over time, they melded into, they built their own culture. Um, um, and then the guards had their own culture, cultures, um, because it, it depended on rank in Japan. Um, 
for, for the prison guards. Um, but I, I, I don't know. It takes in a, I don't know. You just got to watch people. Well, I do think, you know, I mean, I, I'm, uh, obviously I, I don't, I haven't been in the shoes of either of you, but I do think you've, um, you're describing knowledge that you've built up, but that for some persons like Ron's talking about discerning when this is pain that precedes the military, but is exacerbated by combat. And when it's pain that arises from the kind of deep bonds that are forged in the military, and then um, you see um, a buddy that's become like a brother fall. And the kind of pain that, um, that, that may then touch back to older, older difficulties. In other words, there seems to be, as I've listened to the two of you, there seems to be particular issues that might be present. You know, Nancy, you just touched on a big one and I don't mean to interrupt you. No, please, I want you to interrupt. I'm not a parent, okay? So I don't have children. Um, four of the six men I served with that are no longer here had children, wives, kids. Mm -hmm. And they told me that the bond that was created between us in combat was stronger than that that they had with their children. Now, now, I'm not a parent, so I can't quantify that. And I can never, you know, I can't speak to that. But hearing other parents and then hearing other people outside of our unit say that the, the, the bond forged between men in intensive combat is stronger than that between their children, that's a powerful statement. And then to lose those men that you have that bond with and to come back stateside and go back to your family and now your family, your biological, your kids, I've had guys tell me that my kids and my wife were like complete strangers I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't trust them because they didn't have that experience of being in combat where your lives literally depend on one another. Right. Um, I, I just, I, yeah, I, I, I speak about that in the TED talk. It, it's a mm -hmm. lot, that's a lot for me to process because I don't have kids. Well, but I hear that, but it's, it's, it underscores you know, using the skills of CPE and many of our um, listeners are underscoring the importance of what you said, Kyle. It's using those skills alongside this kind of knowledge uh, of the ways in which coming out of the intensity of ties in combat uh, might leave a person um, uh, alone at precisely, em emotionally alone. Uh, um, it, you know, um, some people call this um, ambiguous loss that you, it's a profound loss, but how exactly do I name what this loss is? And, and so there's where I'm, I'm just wondering, Kyle, if having the CPE skills, but also some particular related knowledge to the stress of leaving the mm -hmm. military. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think what I didn't talk about in a CPE tells, it teaches us how to be self-aware at the same time mm -hmm. we're being aware. Mm -hmm. And 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 when we are running out of gas, when we are called to another bedside, mm -hmm. um, another trauma, another uh, wounded Marine, another another injured sailor, um, when we don't have gas, how do we replenish our tanks in a hurry? You know, what, what's 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 the what's the little battery pack we mm -hmm. can insert that will get us through the next one hour, not an hour and a minute, mm -hmm. one hour. Mm -hmm. we've got to find that and that's different for everybody mm -hmm. um that's but we've we've got to find that because we don't have an option not to show up we we've got our people record we are only good if we show up we've got to be we've got to be the presence of something greater than what we're doing mm -hmm. that's what chaplains do we've got to be a greater we've got to be a greater presence of, of eternal concern for one human being. And so not showing up is not an option. Right. So Kyle and Ron, drawing now on your different experiences, as well as your shared experiences in combat, what would be the additional knowledge or the additional kind of training that would help equip a person to be a chaplain um, with folks that are in the brig or in prison, 
a former former active duty. For I, me, I, go ahead. Yeah, if I could briefly, for me, and, and I'll say for me, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but I witnessed this. For me, prior to going on a mission or an operation or even deployments, I steered clear of anyone that was a chaplain. I steered clear. I did, I saw you coming. I ducked around the corner. I even climbed up in a boat one day and hid because I didn't want to talk. And I knew he was looking for me. He wanted to talk to me. And I, I literally climbed up in the captain's boat <laughs> and I get out there. And now, I went to Australia and I was born again there um, at a big gathering. Um, and I frankly don't know why I did that. Um, I just, I was moved to do that. But ever since then, I've kept anything religion at, at such a bay. And so, and I think for a lot of combat vets and a lot of guys going down range, it has to do with knowing that we're going to commit some egregious acts. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that the things we did in combat, it, it, people get confused. You come back from combat and they say, thank you, you're a hero. Thank you for your service. The reality is nothing that happens in combat equates to being a hero. Very few instances of medals of honor, those, those are few and far between where an individual saves the lives of a platoon. Mm -hmm. For me, anytime I saw a chaplain come and I ran the other way, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, it's like those words burned me. If that, if, if it's, I don't know what my own problems are, I don't know, but what I know what- words, What words burned you? Um, God loves you, Jesus died for you. Um, yeah. I had one chaplain that I encountered that I had a conversation with and I didn't even know he was a chaplain because he wasn't dressed like one. He didn't act like one. Uh, and I say that in a positive way. Yeah. It seemed to arrive at a, a place where he came across not to come and preach or to talk scripture to me, just, Hey, do what you need to do to come back. Right. Talk when you come back. Right. And I don't know if that's right or wrong or what they teach in CPE. Um, I just know that I, knowing what happens in combat, I steered clear of clergy right. just because I felt I was violating the very beliefs that I just mm -hmm. added my name to the roles to. You know, and, get, and, and, and Nancy, maybe that's the answer to your question. We've got, we've, we've, got to, we've got to train folks uh, in, not to approach with an agenda. Right. Not, not, not to approach with an agenda, but to receive and to attend to the whole person i'm i'm not there i'm not there to preach a sermon i've got one in my pocket if you want to hear one you bet and i've heard guys request it Few yeah. and far between, though. I, you know right. it was it was not uncommon for you know a convoy getting ready to go and the drivers huddle up and they say chaps hey come here launch us with a prayer mm -hmm. and 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 that's not uncommon but you don't go in asserting your agenda. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give my doctrine um, to you right now. I'm not gonna give you both barrels. I'm gonna. I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna see what you need, and then and then like like Ron, your chaplain said, we can talk when you get back. Because that comment alone instills hope. It did. I could right. back and talk to him actually. It, it seems to me, Kyle, that what you've just shared is an important um, insight to share with persons um, both on the battlefield, but, but also moving into this particular ministry um, is to be, um, be careful not to impose, but to listen for in what ways um, does whatever the if there is a religious context for that person, um, what is it and how, uh, in what ways might it be of use in their present pain, rather than to assume in the way that Ron was saying, he did not want to hear what felt to him uh, at that point is trite. Um, right. Maybe trite is too strong, but not on target with what he was feeling. Yeah. I mean, you can't you can't tell just by looking at somebody what their religion is or non-religion. True. At least I can. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I wasn't maybe I wasn't the right chaplain for that person. Maybe I need to get them connected 
with somebody else, with, with a, an imam, a rabbi, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, a, a priest. Um, I, so I, I, I try to lay all my assumptions aside. Mm -hmm. All I know is this, is this first person's on their way to get, get into a fight. Right. And, and you know, it, it strikes me um, that what, what Ron was lifting up, too, is that an effective, I just help me out on this, Ron, I'm going to try something. Okay. That effective chaplaincy with you would have been not to assume what you needed, um, um, but to but to recognize that you were going into a soul searing experience, um, and to somehow acknowledge that. Would that am I anywhere close to what might have been helpful? Yeah, that soul searing. You hit a bullseye there. So not assuming I have the answer in some particular spirituality, but knowing that I'm, um, I am a representative of religious faith and, and as a chaplain in the military, not any particular one, um, being mindful that this is going to be a, a, a deeply challenging um, experience, spiritual in that sense, not a particular tradition with that and trying to convey that, would that be, would that have been useful to you? Yeah, that, absolutely. Again, for me, in my own ignorance, so to speak, is all I knew is that I was going out to kill people. Yeah. And when I saw a chaplain coming, I, I didn't want to be seen. And when I came back even one time, it was a different one than the guy I spoke to. Like I right. said, he was right. wearing his outfit. And like I said, I ran and hid in the boat. I didn't, I did not want to talk. Right. I'm struck by that. One of the things is that, um, that, I read early on, and um, as Rita um, began to help me think about moral injury, was the fact that well, this is this is a new name for you know we're recovering something a wisdom that was known millennia ago, um, and we we see even a reference in Leviticus that is in the Hebrew scriptures, and also Christian scriptures um, that before men returned from battle, there was a kind of cleansing ritual that they went through um, that was some a kind of acknowledgement that speak? no one no one comes out of battle um, a winner in that sense that we're we're deeply scarred by that i mean because we've we know we've we've injured uh, well like the guy that pulled out the wallet of the person he just killed so there was this kind of ritual of some kind of cleansing you touched on something, so if I may. Sure, um, please, yeah. I, I look Caucasian, but I'm Native American. I'm half Native American and half Sicilian. My dad's full-blooded Native American. Um, without going into it, I, I experienced more than my share of horrific things in Africa at the time that I was there. Every operation that I came back with, I would build an Nipi out of however I could. That's a sweat lodge for right. Native Americans. Right. And we would bring the lava stones in. And what we did in there, it was a cleansing ceremony. Exactly. So called Lakota called it a blood ceremony. Mm -hmm. And in that ceremony is what I did. What we did is we prayed for the lives of the people that we killed right. because they were someone's son. They were right. someone's father, someone's brother. Right. Um, and that, that helped, I think, for me significantly, uh -huh. praying for them. Right acknowledging that they were a human being, a life. They weren't my enemy. They were, well, that's a whole nother subject, but. That is, yeah, but. Um, you, you know, you're spot on, Nancy. And I, I think it, there's a way to, I'm not saying the Native American way is the way for everyone. Right. Whatever everyone does to achieve, I guess, the same type of thing. But you're right. They've been doing that since the dawn of time, right? Exactly. I, mean, I, I, I think because, you know, moral injury is as old as human experience. We just didn't have a word for it back then, right? That we well, at least not that word. Oh, yeah, but, you, but we, but they knew the experience, and clearly, many veterans and active duty find sweat lodges helpful. Um, so, whether one is a Native American by birth or um, knows moral injury, and can find a ritual that helps to, you know, validate that pain. I put hundreds in sweat lodge, and and they somehow it helped them. They seem yeah, to. Yeah. It, it, it absolutely, and there are parallels in other religions, not necessarily building, you know, a sweat lodge, but there are similar, similar rituals. I mean, even in Christianity, we're, we're taught to pray for those 
pray for your enemies and those who persecute you. Yeah. Um, 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 but that gets lost in, in the post, post fight relief. Mm-hmm. And, and the people whose job it is to pay attention to stuff like that, namely chaplains, um, have, have forgotten that because we get really, man, everybody came home. Well, what, we've got to prepare for a, a memorial service for those who didn't come home. Right. And, and we, for, we forget in, in, our, in our rush to honor the dead, we forget to nurture the living. Um, because, and what they live with, right, Kyle? Right, I mean, right. um, so, so this takes me back to the particular kinds of knowledge for chaplains in serving folks in the brig or in a pen, uh, veterans in a penitentiary. Um, how this knowledge, for example, uh, informs the way you might sit beside. Does that make sense? Can you elaborate on how that might be, uh, how that might come to mind with the persons you you two assisted? Actually, Kyle, if, in, in the same vein of what Nancy's asking and having been in prison, as you as a chaplain going to a brig or an institution, one of the things that would, would have been most helpful for me in some of my darkest times is the ability to be taken outside. Yeah. Experience the sun. Yeah. Just that with someone of your qualifications that's gone through the CPE, I mean, that, that, that could turn the corner for someone. Because again, when you're in a brig or a prison setting, it's gray, concrete, dark, dingy. Yeah. It's just, it's horrible. You're, you're at your lowest point. And I, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm interrupting you. Go ahead, finish your thought. I, I just don't know if that is even possible. It, it, it is. Um, you're reminding me of, of, a, of a detainee we had once uh, when I was on the East Coast. Um, and their religion at that specific time of year, they had to have a window so that they could see the moon. I, that, never crossed, that never crossed my mind. And it was my responsibility to make that happen within the institution of, the, of that given brig. And, and we made it happen. I, I thought it was kind of silly until I started to think about it. Now, wait, what's my job here as chaplain? And, and what's, what's gonna bring, if, if, we, if our goal is to, to, to reduce recidivism, what's my, what's my job here? So we made that happen. Um, that particular sailor, went on to have 10 more years in the Navy without incident. Mm. Um, um, so I, I think you're right. Well, and I'm a big proponent of, that's why I joined the chaplain course so I could get outside. Mm. Um, um, I think that's right. And I think, I think your program that includes um, physical fitness, I think that's a, that's a, I can't stress that enough to chaplains right. who have to be physically fit because even if we're never going outside the wire, our duties require physical stamina and it's a rigorous lifestyle even even when we're not going outside the wire. Right. I want to share a question that Kristen has posed um, coming from the just a lively conversation in the chat and and the, as she summarized it in a, well in a question and I'll share it with you for your for both of you to respond. What might it look like if our country took responsibility for the events that led to moral injury, um, at least from their experience of war, in incarcerated women and men? Can you read that again? Sure. What might it look like if the country took responsibility for the events that led to moral injury in incarcerated women and men, um, particularly events that arose from their, their duty um, in the military. I, I, That's a loaded question. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I, I think I think it speaks to. I mean, we 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 live under civilian leadership. We all bear responsibility for going to war, for making the decision to go mm-hmm. to war. Every voter makes That's that right. decision. Everybody who doesn't vote acquiesces to that decision. Mm-hmm. As as our colleague Beth Stallinger says. You know, we are all complicit That's right. in sending people to war. We, we've got, as a nation, we've got to own it. And, and that's going to go a long way to helping returning combatants wherever they wind up. 
saying this is not all on me this is this is not and that's a knowledge for a chaplain isn't it i think i think you're right yeah how is that how does that work out in your program for veterans healing veterans wrong yeah what we're dealing with in the program we're it, it's comprised of several com components the curriculum ptsd moral injury injury resiliency inoculation training um incarceration center and post-incarceration center with what we're doing narration therapy it has the word therapy in it we're doing writing prompts we're exploring mm -hmm. things going all right. the way back to your childhood yeah to incorporate your military prison and on to civilian life mm -hmm. um i try to not that that's a political question because I don't think it is, but it kind of is. Um, I steer clear of politics and religion in the program. Sure, that make, I can see. <laughs> we're, we're, let me tell you, that can gets opened. Oh my. Yeah. And we and we honor and respect everyone's belief in religious and whatever it is. But we also ask them before they come into the group to check that hat at the door. Yeah. You, you do this work, not say Jesus died for you, so you don't have to do this work. And believe me, I've heard that. And, and my only response to that could be, well, maybe Jesus put you here. Um, I, I'm not a, I'm not a, I, yeah, I, I'm not, I don't claim to be that person. Um, so yeah, in the program, we're working on internal stuff, um, how that relates to society in general. I mean, it's cliche anymore, but the reality is nobody wins a fight. Right. You just don't. And, and frankly, honestly, in my opinion, in my experience, um, what it takes to win, you literally come away more of a loser, hmm. even if you won. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that I can accurately address that question. It's just, I mean, and then again, I'll, I'll turn around and say something like, you know, there's a reason you can get in your car in the morning and go to Starbucks or go yeah. to Subway or go here or go there. And again, cliche, freedom isn't free. You're darn right it's not free. And there are people out there right now in the special forces community operating in 127 countries, and that's not publicized. 127 countries we're fighting right now, special forces operators, Green Beret, Delta, Air Force PJ, SEALs, Dev Group, Force Recon. They're doing things out there to keep at bay people who are very intent and serious about being evil. In, in bringing down our way of life and, and right. that it when you're involved in that kind of stuff you have to take morals and check that at the door or you're not going to be able to pull the trigger when you need to right people in society don't fully understand that people that haven't served don't mm -hmm. fully understand what it takes to do that what it takes to have the country that we have less than one percent of americans have served right we're near the end and I, I want each of you to have a chance. Um, I, I want to assure you that this chat has been very lively and, and um, apparently there's a lot of um, appreciation for what, um, what we talked about in terms of the sweat lodge experience or the some mm -hmm. sense of release um, and, of, um, and sharing that together. Um, but I, I want, uh, I want to see if they're for closing, if um, if either of you has things you, I assume you do, things you'd want to say in a, in a kind of summarizing way. Kyle? <laughs> Chicken. Um, <laughs> Sock back. Pray, pray for I'll come peace. back to you, Ron. Pray, pray for peace. Um, hug your family, hug your neighbor. And don't judge somebody until you've walked in their shoes for a while. Okay. You know, is all I know, um, all the work that I've done in, in the field of psychology, all the study in sociology, the work that I'm doing now, um, I wake up every day crying. Uh, and, and I'm a peer to peer, I believe in that work. But I know that our people that have gone down range that seem to be healthy and they look unmarred and they, they have all their limbs, um, they're walking with demons. 
Right. And, and I don't know how to guide chaplains to help them other than what you said, Kyle. And it's it's not coming with an agenda. It's just being a, a good ear, mm -hmm. a listener. And often in the process of lis listening, the moment will present itself for you to deliver your message, so to speak. And I think you just have to be keen on looking for that moment. And and even if the message is, we'll talk when you get back. Yeah. That's a great message. Yeah, I think so too. I, and, you know, I, I appreciate the ways in which that it seems to me that from what I understand about the sweat lodge experience and I, um, is that um, it is that uh, you're sitting together knowing each of you has has incurred demons uh, in the service of the country, um, if not in other ways as well. Um, but there's um, some sense of, um, well, at least commonality, but also some relief from that, that seems to come from that sweat lodge experience of, um, uh, at least as people have talked with me about it. Um, and maybe that's, you know, to circle back just for a moment, the one of the kinds of knowledge that we need to be effective, um, whether it's in the penitentiary or uh, in the brig, um, not knowing what those demons are, right. um, but assuming they're not, that, that you have some familiarity with them and how do you make yourself available? It, it's as I've listened to the ways you two have described your work, um, that seems to me to be a very important aspect of it. Would that be a fair summary or a fair comment? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've come to the end of this time, and I um, I want you to know you've created a rich experience for the folks that have been a part of this webinar, and I'm confident it will be rich for others that come to view this site later. And I'm very grateful for the work each of you is doing. Uh, and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank My you. honor. Great. Thank you, everyone. Remember that this, uh, this will be available to you in about two weeks. If you want to look at it again or share it with others, you're welcome.